Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight, the official YouTube channel of SerialAtMidnight.com. My name is Heath, and I'm glad you're here because we're going to be talking about this. This is the new limited edition three Blu-ray set of Waterworld from Arrow Video. And right off the top, I have to tell you, this is one of the most impressive physical media editions of anything ever. Uh, that I have ever had the pleasure to to have in my collection. Criterion Collection, eat your heart out. This thing is insane. Uh, and so I'm going to endeavor to, to cover this in a way that is deserving of this package. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the edition itself, the Arrow version of it, but then we'll also talk about Water... I have a lot to say about Waterworld. Uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is my favorite movie. Kevin Reynolds is directing. Kevin Costner starring. This was four years later. Same director, same star completely different results. Um, I have every reason to be invested in this movie and I have so many things to say. But uh, let's talk about the packaging itself. So I'm going to give you a look at it. Uh, I'm sure there are probably multiple unboxing videos of this on YouTube, but uh, it has uh, a reversible uh, reversible artwork on this Blu-ray set, but and I have chosen the the other art is this this art right here. I've chosen this because I always like variety. If you have you know spice things up, let's let's mix it up just a little bit. So we have three discs: the the theatrical cut with the bonus features, a TV cut, and then the Ulysses cut. Uh, more on that in a minute. And then there's some pack-ins here. They've given us some some little some little goodies. Era also does this thing where they include these art cards of other titles that they that they distribute. Here's one. Mine was uh, it's Terry Gilliam's Tideland, which I haven't seen. But these these art cards are really cool. On the back of them, they're all the same. It's the uh, basically the one sheet poster art for Waterworld. But then the other side. So here's Kevin Costner swinging through flames heroically. By the way, his stunt work in this is very impressive. I'm sure he didn't do all of it, but some of it he clearly did. And it's impressive. Uh, Kevin Costner yelling heroically. Uh, Kevin Costner scowling heroically. <laughs> um, more of Kevin Costner scowling heroically. This is pretty much his range in this movie. There's no point where he's just like, you know, beaming. He, his entire persona in this role is just like, you know, Clint Eastwood kind of a scowl thing. Uh, here's some of our supporting characters, Tina Marjor Majorino and uh, Gene Triplehorn. And last but not least, actually, maybe I have more to say about this. Uh, Dennis Hopper being Dennis Hopper. Uh, and so those are cool. Those are nice, nice little pack-ins to have here. But that's just the tip of the iceberg because the packaging also comes with this 60-page perfect bound book. It's not a booklet. It's an actual book filled with... Uh, Publicity photos, publicity stills, behind-the-scenes photos, and very in-depth essays on the movie itself, the context of the movie, uh, an interview with Kevin Costner made during the time of this uh, film from, I believe it was from Starlog Magazine, a, uh, an article about the computer game from the mid-90s. There's stuff about um, the, there's a Super Nintendo game artwork in here. There's stuff about a board game, the the movie tie-in, the novelization, a comic book from 1997, stuff that I honestly didn't know exist or maybe had forgotten existed. This booklet is amazing and we're still not done because the last little bit of physical stuff in the package, guys, physical media is not dead. Physical media is alive and well. Uh, it's just moving to things like this. Um, we have a poster. On one side, we have the, the one-sheet theatrical poster art. And on the other side, we have the, uh, the newly commissioned art for this Blu-ray. Stunning. Seriously stunning. But where the thing really shines is on the disc, the discs themselves. Um, so disc one has the theatrical cut and then a feature-length documentary called Maelstrom. It's specifically called Maelstrom, The Odyssey of Waterworld. And it's about an hour and 40, I think it's like an hour and 42 minutes. Uh, and it is an exhaustive look at the production history from conception all the way to release, 
the box office, a, a lot of the dirt comes out because there's a lot more dirt than most on Waterworld. For a long time, Water, for a few years, Waterworld was the most expensive movie ever made. It didn't make a lot of money at the box office because the budget was so high. Um, it kind of has become a cautionary tale of what can happen with uh, studio movies when things just escalate further and further. Star egos, a lot of things go into this. Waterworld was a perfect storm of circumstances. And a lot of it comes out in the documentary. Some of it still doesn't, um, but it's a fantastic documentary that, that makes the package alone, uh, the, the documentary makes the package worth the price of admission. Uh, and then there's also the vintage electronic press kit. It's like a nine minute <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, electronic press kit from when the movie was made that they would use to pitch it to people. Uh, there's a, uh, a 22 minute overview from a film historian about the history of the post-apocalyptic movie, going back to the silent days, to the time of H.G. Wells, all the way up through Waterworld, and how they kind of changed and morphed, and how Waterworld was more ambitious in many ways than any of them. So it's fascinating. It is really fascinating what this movie represents. And we are going to talk about the movie. I have so much to say. Uh, disc two is the TV cut which is about 40 minutes longer. Here's the thing, Waterworld for me was already too long. I don't need more stuff. I don't, basically what the TV cut did is added deleted scenes. The thinking being, the longer the movie, hey, people wanna see this movie, they wanna see it for free on television, we'll make it as long as we can, and then we can have like a ton of advertisements in it. We can hire, it's more commercial rates that we can put into the, uh, you know, it's more revenue. So usually the director would have nothing to do with TV cuts, it's all, hey, in, in this case, the director didn't have a lot to do with the theatrical cut, but we'll get to it. Um, and then disc three is the Ulysses cut, which is uh, about two minutes longer than the TV cut. And as, as I understand it, it's kind of a fan cut that puts the, uh, there were censored parts of the TV cut because of TV. Uh, and it, it, it allows those to be shown in their full, uh, full capacity. It says uh, previously censored shots and dialogue. So just a little bit extra. Where do we start with this? See, I, so I've told you a little bit my a little bit about my history with Kevin Reynolds and Kevin Costner. Here's the thing: I, I enjoy this movie. I, I guess I'm a fan of this movie. Uh, I've bought this movie on every format that it's come out on. I bought it on a VHS, DVD, now uh, the standard Blu-ray, which is pointless now. It has no special features, uh, and now this. And if it comes out on like hollow imagery for like hollow glasses or something, VR experience, I'll probably buy it again because I want to love Waterworld. And that's the thing is I want to love it, but I, I never do. I always approach it excited, looking forward to watching it. Uh, I'm a fan of the concept. It's a post-apocalyptic thriller. Basically it's Mad Max on water. It had roots in exploitation. The, the, the writers of the, when this was conceived, it was supposed to be a, an exploitation movie, a Mad Max style movie, Mad Max on water. It was designed to be shot quickly, cheaply. Uh, it was shopped to Roger Corman, who said, I don't think I can make this for under $3 million. <laughs> and it would eventually be well over $200 million in the 90s. Um, it was never conceived as what it became. And I think that that shows it's honestly, it's a miracle this movie was even made. And I think that the reason that it was made is because they were just too deep into it to stop making it. Uh, so every, every time I watch it, I go into it wanting to love it, excited about watching it because it's an exploitation movie, Mad Max on water. Sign me up. That's a fantastic concept. In the movie, the polar ice caps have melted. The earth is covered with water. Um, so it's got a little bit of an eco message, you know, like, hey, respect nature. Don't, you know, don't spit in nature's face or it might spit back at you. Um, but every single time I watch this movie, even the theatrical cut, I just end up exhausted because there's so much. It just becomes numbing at a certain point. Um, and the other cuts of this movie do not fix it. They just make it a little bit worse. It's nice to have additional um, data, more, more information about the movie by watching like the Ulysses cut is it like it's it's good it's good I enjoy it having I, I never seen the Ulysses cut now I have I know why it's called the Ulysses cut I know the scenes that were cut out of it and how they were up like Kevin Reynolds was upset about it here's the thing Kevin Reynolds shot this movie went through all the pains 
Let me back up. Kevin Costner was attached to this movie. At the time that he was signed for this movie, he was the biggest movie star in the world, which that in and of itself kind of perplexes me. Remember, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is my favorite movie, but he has this Midwestern um, hardness, this, this f like a farmer who's seen the tough winners. It's just this hardness. That doesn't speak movie star to me, but somehow during those, you know, during the, the late 80s and the early 90s, uh, up to this, really, he was huge. He, he could write his own ticket in Hollywood. And uh, he said that he would not agree to appear in this movie and to, un unless Kevin Reynolds could direct it because he'd had a good experience with Robin Hood. Although there are so many stories about fighting between the two of them on Robin Hood who would get ultimate creative control. So here comes Kevin Costner with Kevin Reynolds. Fast forward to the end of their production. They have a blow up over Waterworld. Kevin Reynolds walks. He doesn't, he, he turns in a movie that he believes in, the movie that he thought he was making. And the studio is like, this isn't what we hired you to make. And Kevin Costner is like, this isn't what we talked about. So Kevin Reynolds walks. Kevin Costner, as confirmed in the documentary on this uh, Blu-ray, Kevin, Kevin Costner invests his own money into the picture, upwards of $22 million. They don't say how much, but I've heard it was over $20 million of his own money and finishes directing the movie himself. Uh, it's very, very interesting. So the extended cuts, who knows what the original, uh, I don't think we still have the, the, like what Kevin Reynolds intended for this movie. I don't think that movie has ever been, uh, put anywhere. It's not the theatrical cut. It's not the TV cut. Maybe an argument is to be made that the Ulysses cut is closer because some of the things that he was sad to see leave, uh, are in that Ulysses cut, but I don't think that it makes it a better movie. It just makes it more of what it already is which is a lot of characters, a lot of business, a lot of action, a lot of stuff. There's not a whole lot of substance. And in a, in a $5 million low-budget post-apocalyptic movie, that's fine because you're spending time with people. Uh, there are obstacles that you have to overcome by stripping away from those things, right? You have to Low budget, why I love low budget film and exploitation cinema and things like that is because the human element always rises. The human element is hard to find in Waterworld, and that's the thing, or, or maybe it's just too much of a human element. I'm not sure because you have boating rigs that cost a million dollars, you have a city that they literally built on the ocean that costs like 22 million dollars or something like that. Um, everything is just excessive to the nth degree. But that makes it impressive because Waterworld still remains one of the, I, I honestly don't know if there's any other movie quite like it because of its expense and because of the egos involved. Uh, so much of this stuff, there's very little CGI in the movie. It's all practical. It's not all practical, but I'd say it's 95% practical um, where it's all special, you know, it's real explosions. They shot the entire movie on water there's a story in the documentary where uh, Kevin Reynolds called Steven Spielberg to ask him about shooting on water. He said, hey, we're going to do a movie shooting on water. Do you have any advice about shooting on water? Because he'd done Jaws. Spielberg had done Jaws. And Steven Spielberg said, yeah, don't shoot on water. <laughs> Fake it. Do it in a studio. Uh, but they did it on water. And it both succeeds and fails because of that. It, it, it has limitations because of that. But it's also incredibly beautiful, incredibly stunning. Um, I think that Waterworld achieves what it was trying to achieve, but it just does it with so much excess that I just get worn out. Dennis Hopper is another problem in this movie because Dennis, look, Dennis Hopper is great. I like Dennis Hopper, but he did the same thing over and over and over again. And, and you find out like the performance that he turns in in this movie. It's the speed Dennis Hopper. It's, it's all these Dennis Hopper performances you've seen in other things. Um, then you find out some of the other people that were going to be, that were offered the Dennis Hopper character. And it kind of seems like they, they, I don't want to say they settled, but I don't think he was their. Well, I know he wasn't their first choice. Sam Jackson turned it down. Now this isn't in the documentary. This is just things that I know from the production history. Sam Jackson turned it down. Could you imagine Samuel L. Jackson with the eye patch like 15 years before, or 10, 10, 12, 13 years before uh, Nick Fury. Um, Gary Oldman turned it down. Uh, Gary Busey was offered the role. G Gary Busey would have been amazing. He would have worked well in a cheaper version of this movie. Uh, so many people were connected to this movie in that Dennis Hopper part and ultimately dropped out. Some of the supporting characters I think are interesting. Tina Marjorino and, or Majorino and uh, Gene Triplehorn are 
good. I think I think Tina Majorino is better than Gene Triplehorn. Gene Triplehorn just kind of looks perplexed through most of the movie. And again, I go back to the Kevin Costner thing. Like he's just so, uh, just so blank, so mm, stern through the whole movie. And then Kevin Reynolds says that Costner was going through a divorce, and he was just generally ticked off, and he brought that to his role intentionally or unintentionally that's where he was at the time um so between those you know there's michael jeter who i think is a good actor or was rest in peace he has left us now but he gives a performance in this movie that honestly it embarrasses me uh it's not necessarily a good performance it's so big as is most of the things in this movie it's just so big there's a scene with uh, Jack Black is in it. You kind of don't recognize him unless you know to look for him, but Jack Black's in it. Uh, here's an interesting fact. Joss Whedon, the legendary Joss Whedon, was brought in to do some rewrites, um, and he says it was seven weeks in hell. He did not enjoy his time rewriting this movie. It sounds like I don't like Waterworld, but I, I do enjoy so much, so many aspects of the movie. Kevin Costner... Looks great. I think he's probably in the best physical shape of his entire life. He looks fantastic. He's just tanned and he's muscular. He does a lot of his, you can see he's in camera doing a lot of his own stunt work. And there may have been some help with some rigs or some cables or something like that. But so much of it is him and it's impressive, especially knowing his age at the time. Uh, I love the setting. I love the idea of a post-apocalyptic uh, water world. All that is so interesting. The search for dry land, the piracy that rises up. This is good stuff. It just didn't come together in a way that was compelling. And even in the documentary, they talk to these filmmakers and all the people behind the scenes. And they still, even all these years later, they still seem to think that they're being victim. They're, vi they're victims of the publicity machine. It's not the movie's fault. It's the publicity's fault. Um, and I think that's a little bit disingenuous because there's a lot to own up for. Uh, again, it's not a bad movie. It's, it's fun at times. It's got a lot going on for it with it but it's not a home run and i think we have to be honest for me i'm going to be honest i don't think it's a home run but yet it is a movie that i continue to revisit and will always continue to revisit because it is a time capsule of 1995 probably the peak of a certain kind of cinema after jurassic park before the rise of cgi uh, big blockbuster movies. Here's a movie, mostly practical, huge budget. Uh, and they would really never do that again. They would film it on a studio. There'd be lots of CGI elements. Waterworld is the pinnacle of 90s cinema. And 90s, 90s cinema was the pinnacle of something else as well. A certain kind of movie kind of kind of reached and pinnacled there. Uh, Terminator 2, True Lies, Waterworld, and then it's kind of on to something else, into another cycle. So... With all that being said, I love this. I, I don't necessarily love the movie, but I love this packaging. This is, uh, while again, I think this is trying to be presented as like a like, hey, you should give Waterworld a second look. It's a forgotten masterpiece. I don't know that it's a forgotten masterpiece. And to be fair, no one on here says that that's what it is. But I kind of feel like that's what we do. You know, a couple of decades go by, we're like, hey, you guys, such and such is way better than you remember it. Waterworld is not better than I remember it. And no matter what cut I watch, it's the same movie, just different versions of that movie. Um, but it's it's fun. It's it, it has a charm. It has a place. And I continue to watch it every few years because it's Waterworld. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's the moral of the story. It's not good. It's not bad. It's Waterworld. It's its own thing. Uh, so I highly recommend you guys check this out. It is... Uh, this is Cinema Archives, right? This is... If, if this is the direction physical media is going, if we're going to, you know, not walk into a brick and mortar store and see whatever movie we want, but we have to mail order stuff like this, and this is what we get, sign me up. I'm all for it. This is a stunning, stunning package, a stunning presentation. Uh, this is one of my, this is becoming one of the prides, the prides of, it's part of the pride of my collection. It is uh, something I'm so happy to have. I love it. I absolutely love it. Everyone involved in the creation of this, Job well done. Uh, hands down, one of the best ever. Thank you guys so much for making this happen. And thank you guys for watching this video. I would like to know your thoughts on Waterworld. I know this is a little bit of a longer video, but there was a lot to talk about. Uh, but what do you think about Waterworld? Do you have this edition? What do you think about this edition? Um, 
do you think I'm wildly off base with my read of Waterworld? Do you think it's a masterpiece? I would love to know what you think in the comments below. So guys, I do appreciate your time. Thank you for watching. Take care and I will catch you later.